This is the Jayhawker Podcast, presented by the University of Kansas Health System. We're back here on the Jayhawker Podcast. I am Greg Gurley, along with Wayne Simeon. The Jayhawker Podcast, brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Black and & Veatch, and Xfinity. This is now the off-season for Kansas basketball, both men's and women's, while the season is unfortunately still going on. First weekend exits for the men and the women in the field of 32. A lot to talk about. Wayne, how are you, buddy? Yeah, yeah, doing pretty good. Um, Hey, let's start with Salt Lake. Why don't we? So I spent a little more time in Salt Lake than you did. You came out on game day. We got our whole run of the place, got there on Tuesday and uh, very clean city. Not a very busy city for the amount of people there, but uh, they must all work indoors and not go outside. It was great weather, beautiful scenery. Snow-capped uh, mountains, every direction. It was great. And you know, Greg, the, the first thought that I had, I hadn't been to Salt Lake City in Utah or Salt Lake City in decades uh, since uh, back when I was uh, in the league playing against the Jazz. But my first thought was, okay, this is a nice place to spend a few days. But then it hit me like, oh, wait a minute. We're going to be spending a lot more time here because we've got the exciting additions of BYU, obviously, this year, but also Utah. Uh, coming in to join the Big 12 Conference next year. And so it hit me like, hey, we're going to be spending some time here and hopefully we're going to be garnering a lot, a lot of wins here in all of our sport programs. But a great way to start it off uh, with the NCAA tournament, first and second round for, for the men. You know, we got home Saturday about midnight after our loss to Gonzaga and Brian Haney and the baseball team turned right back around and went, to Salt Lake City to take on BYU in baseball, in which they won uh, earlier this week, I believe nine to one, so or, or eleven to one. So nice job there. But uh, yeah, as you look at the end, um, frustrating, uh, but a, f- a fun game in that first round against Samford. I don't know if Kansas fans will agree with me because the fun part of it was that we were up twenty-two. They Samford climbed all the way back through. Uh, an unbelievable shooting barrage that uh, we struggled with defending. And then, you know, we just had the wherewithal to to stick to it and get that win. I know a lot of people around the country will say that it was a clean block, and I agree with them. It was clean. But in the moment, the way it was called, I give Nick a ton of credit because if he doesn't go up and try to dunk that ball, they don't call a foul, but he went aggressively to the rim, tried to dunk it. Now to all the naysayers out there that say they blew the call, blew the call. When Sanford was making their run, the referees played into the moment and every little touch they got to the line. They called fouls on us. The referees helped them out a lot. A couple of those fouls on Dewan were ridiculous there in the second half. So yes, the block was clean. I don't disagree. And if you find anybody that says that was a foul, they just have on red and blue glasses. And But it was was a foul because it was called a foul. Yeah, and, and, it, and it was a bang-bang play, uh, to be frank, man. It was a fast-paced, full-court action there. Um, we and the rest of the sports world have the luxury of being able to see that play in slow motion over and over and over again. I'm not quite sure you could have deciphered uh, that it was a, a miss, at least from the referee's angle. But as you mentioned, uh, there are a lot of you know bad calls uh, during that game. I thought leaving away from that Sanford game, it was, it was a fun game. I really enjoyed uh, watching it. I would categorize it as our best road win of the season. And, and for the viewership that didn't have the opportunity to be there in person, I don't know if they could feel it or if they could sense it from watching at home, but that was a pro Samford crowd. Other than the roughly maybe 800 Kansas fans that were there, it might have been even a little less, the entire arena was cheering uh, for Samford. And it actually started in the game ahead of us when, uh, who, who was it? It was Gonzaga and McNeese State were playing. And during that game, they put up on the Jumbotron the Kentucky-Oakland upset that was happening. And the crowd lost 
uh, any type of interest in the Gonzaga McNeese State game that was going on in front of them, all eyes turned to the jumbotron, and it was you know it was pretty significant and loud cheering section for that upset, and so that was an indicator of what the temperature would be like once Kansas took the floor against Sanford, and it was proven to be true. And also, I believe that. Uh, one of Sanford's players was actually from the Salt Lake City area or a Utah kid. And so that it, it felt every bit like a road environment, which you might think, oh, man, how does KU blow a 22 point lead? Hey, that that was a full blown road game that uh, that they experienced against Sanford. Well, to your point, when we were there, they were booing the the video board operator because they were taking away the Kentucky Oakland game on the big screen because the Gonzaga McNeese state game was over in the first 10 minutes and Gonzaga had a considerable lead. And so they were booing and then everybody was in that underdog mode, right? They were like, all right, Oakland just beat Kentucky. I want to cheer on Sanford. I don't care about Kansas. I live in Utah. I just want the underdog. And that's the beauty of the tournament. Yeah, and Kansas is going to be kicking BYU and Utah butt for years to come, coming in the Big Big Twelve. So, uh, yeah, so you were kind of bit of extra. I was kind of hoping that maybe our new Big Twelve brethren would have been like, "All right, I'm going to root for Kansas because they're in our league." But no, like you said, 800 might be a little strong. It was probably like 500 on that Thursday game, but. Uh, Again, but a faithful yeah. 500, man. There were some folks oh, yeah. that came down from from Idaho. There was a, a incredible couple uh, that had planned on meeting us in Omaha. They're from Omaha. We didn't take care of business. Wasn't able to go up to Omaha as a two seed, but yet they made the effort to come all the way out to Salt Lake City. So though we were few in numbers, there were some 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 faithful and loyal Jayhawks that made the big time effort to get there. Uh, so so hats off to them. You scroll, tap swipe text call and do a lot more on your phone none of us can fathom life without all the world's knowledge in our pocket we use phones for just about everything but when it comes to doing the bigger things like streaming gaming and working you shouldn't be limited to just your phone screen or mobile plan you see millions of americans don't have home internet they are forced to do everything on their phone or through their mobile service via a hotspot or they go to public spaces and use unsecure wi-fi which can be problematic when dealing with personal or sensitive information. You deserve reliable home internet to fit your life and your budget. And right now, Internet Essentials Plus from Xfinity is free through the Affordable Connectivity Program. Get unlimited data and equipment included with no annual contract. Go to Xfinity.com free to see if you qualify. Restrictions apply. After program participation ends, Comcast standard charges, taxes, and fees apply. May not be combined with other offers. I had this patient. His cancer treatment had him in the hospital for a while. One day, he was telling me about his grandson and how a big night was coming up for him. So we arranged to make it a big night for my patient too. I sometimes wonder if I'm doing all I can. Then I help make a moment like this possible, and I know I am. Before we get to the Gonzaga game, the call at the end of the Sanford game, which we've discussed a lot, I want your take on what do you think about the way that NCAA tournament games have been officiated? I'll give you my take first, and then I want yours. So, number one, I always have a problem with officials, the way they do it, not officials in general, not the individual person, but the way that they assign is throughout the whole year – you got a team of three that are Big 12 officials that do all kinds of games. They see how you play. You got a team of three, SEC and Big 10. And sometimes those leagues over, overlap, and guys that we see in the Big 12 also referee in other leagues. Fine. But what they do in the NCAA tournament is they mix, they cross the streams, they put a couple of Big 12 guys with an SEC guy, maybe guys that have never worked together. And there's a rhythm with officiating. And when you're with a couple guys that you don't know anything about or a, you just have a different way of calling things, it, it it just doesn't – it's not as – there's not as much rhythm in the game. And I've seen that. Uh, we saw the Houston-Texas A&M game. Four Houston players fouled out. Several Texas A&Ms 
I mean, it was ridiculous how many fouls were called. Then you see other games that they let everything go. So it's hard as players and coaches to figure out how to play. Guys don't really care how you call it as long as it's consistent. And I don't believe that throughout the year is, is there two different ways to call games throughout your league year and then the NCAA tournament. And that's hard for teams to adjust. Yeah, you know, it really is. And, and look, officiating is one of the most difficult things uh, in the world uh, to do. So so I, I certainly don't want to pile on to that. I, I think there is something to what you said about uh, crews throughout the year, uh, developing a rhythm, uh, developing eyes, developing, uh, you know, a, a teamwork uh, that, that, that you see on a regular basis. Now, of course, if you throw a Big 12, uh, you know, three person crew, uh, there for our game. Of course, Sanford would have something to complain about or another conference. Sure. So there's always going to be something to complain about when it comes to them. Two things that, that, that come to mind as you talk about officiating. The first is actually what I actually thought won the game for us is having to play the last four minutes of the first half without Dewan Harris. I mean, when he went down with four minutes, I mean, you're looking to the bench. You're looking like, man, who is going to run the show for us? And I basically cringed for those last four minutes, and we were able to narrowly escape uh, with maybe a four point a four point margin going into halftime. You know, a lot of that had to do with those early fouls that Juan picked up. One of them was kind of a phantom foul uh, as well. And then we get to the start of the second half, the first four minutes there, which is when we're able to really extend that lead up to 22 points. And that gave us just of enough cushion that when the momentum swung, when we ran out of gas, when more foul trouble ensued, uh, that it was just enough cushion to where Sanford couldn't fully close the gap. I mean, they, they were they were barely back. They took a ton of energy to cut it to single digits, but they just didn't quite have enough uh, to be able to close. The thing that stood out to me, specifically officiating uh, in regards to that game, and you and I talk about this some, um, in the beginning of the year, there's always what? a rules emphasis, okay, where you've got uh, a head official from the league or a head official, you know, from the NCAA that comes in, uh, they officiate a scrimmage, you know, of our guys and an in-house scrimmage, and then they talk about, they sit down with the team and talk about, hey, different rules emphasis, rule changes for that year. And then what typically happens, it's heavily enforced early on in early November, and then pretty much by the time conference play, it disappears. So with that in mind, and thinking back to that Sanford game, Greg, when was the last time you saw this right here? The flop call, right? This hand motion right here signifying the, the new rule of, of, of the flop. Like, man, I, I, I can't remember the last time it was that I've seen that. And so when you have, you know, a bunch of guards like Sanford who, who are scrappy, who are feisty, who are up under you. Um, you got guys on rosters like a Baylor, like a Texas that have a reputation of doing things like that. It's like, man, how, how are we going to be able to stay consistent with the rules emphasis or even with a, a, a new call like a flop when the games matter the most? Because there could have been a couple of them out there that we saw uh, in, in that in that Sanford game. And, and I was kind of beside myself, though I was not shocked that I didn't see that that play out or called. And so I would say if there was anything that would caught my attention from an officiating standpoint, it'd be about some of the rule emphasis that you see in the beginning of the year and how they not just, you know, dwindle down as the season goes along, but Greg, they completely disappear. I mean, disappear. And so that, that'd be my, my only, uh, my only take on, on officiating. And I want to make it clear. I'm not bagging on officials. I'm not bagging on officials against Kansas. We need, we need them. It's tough. Yes. Yeah. This, this is a, a broader view as a college basketball fan because I watch every game. I'm sitting here working a couple TVs and an iPad. I watch them all. And I've seen it in games that I could care less about. You know, Auburn and Yale, I don't care, but I watch it and I see the way that game is called compared to the Houston Texas AM game or whatever. And it's just, so uh, I use the word rhythm, but cohesiveness amongst crews, I find to just be non-existent at times. And, and coaches are just over there like, I don't know what to tell my guys. And, and I think there, that definitely needs to be looked at. Uh, I completely agree with you on the flop thing. I mean, 
where I, I say I wouldn't complain about the Kansas game, but in that Sanford game, they jammed our guys and they were holding them so they couldn't get open on the press. And so grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. And then when Dewan goes like this, they call an offensive foul. And so they failed to not call the foul early, which again established some consistent where consistency where those guys, all right, I can grab them, claw, do whatever. They're not going to call it. And the second one goes like this, it's a foul. So you miss the early one. It's age old. They always get the second guy. It's just like with our kids, whatever. She started it or he started it. That's not an excuse, but but uh, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm just making a comment on possibly keeping guys together to ref games. And and But to your point, Samford would be pissed if there was a Big 12 crew. Now, they wouldn't do that, but let's say it was an SEC crew doing our game or whatever. There's a, you're always going to find something to – complain about but uh, yeah. uh again but, that, but, but, I, but I, I want to go i want to go back not just to complaining but man we got a, we got to highlight hey how about and, and, and it, it goes by quick because you have a game to play in the next two days but how about the 19 and 20 that hunter had coming off a, a dislocated yeah. shoulder all right how about the game nick timberlake had johnny furphy getting in there grabbing a bunch of rebounds and you know kj with seven dunks i mean that that, that was an exciting game um, and there were a lot of lot of lot of great bright spots that took place, um, and so it's really easy to to dismiss that because we go right into Gonzaga and then the loss, and now we're thinking about oh man, you know, hey, what do we got to do for next season? But I, th I thought that was a, a valiant effort, especially from Hunter. Again, as a guy that's had to fight through shoulder injuries and know how painful that is, know of the the kind of a psychological uh, war that takes place when you got guys hanging on you and and, and you're testing it out for the first time, and so. There were some there were some big bright moments that took place during that Sanford game that, that I think are important to recognize even uh, a few days after. And I'm glad you said that, and it puts a cherry on top of a really good win. Uh, it was Hunter Dickinson who fought through a lot wearing that big shoulder harness, and I contend that we don't win that game unless Sanford presses us. Their press Helped gave us, us so <laughs> many easy baskets because you can't press a big time team it's never worked bill self was salivating like all right yeah press us after missed free throws fine go dewan carves it up nick carves it up how many dunks layups and open threes i i, I have to go back and watch it but i bet you i don't know 40 to 50 percent of our points were easy baskets if they just play a half court defense against us I still think we carve them up because they didn't have an answer for Hunt, but we got so many easy buckets. And when you win by, I don't even know what we win by three or four. When you win by three or four, every little bit counts. And getting all those easy buckets on a team that labors to score at times, especially when the other team is making threes and you're making twos, the math doesn't work. Greg, look, if you would have told me that we would have played a game where we allowed 16 made threes by the opponent, had 18 turnovers, were missing a starter, had another All-American coming back from an injury, and had to play the majority of the first half without our point guard, Dewan Harris. And if you would have told me all those things and asked me if I thought we would have won, I would have said, absolutely not. Yeah, and the turnovers that you bring up weren't against their press. Their press didn't – they didn't turn us – they did a few times, but the majority of those turnovers were charges or half-court set or somebody coming from behind in a half-court set. It wasn't the press. The press helped us, and I wish Gonzaga would have pressed us. But uh, Mark Few is like, like – and this is nothing against Bucky McMillan. That works. He's a system guy. Yeah, for his that, style of basketball and his personnel and in that conference where they got to play night in, night out, it works. And you got to shoot your shot. That's what you do when you're him. You come in there and they're going to, hey, we got here doing this. We're going to do it. We've seen UAB try it. We've seen uh, West Virginia. I mean, Bob Huggins got to the Big 12 and his first year or two was press Virginia and teams carved him up and it wasn't successful because you have guards that are athletic that can dribble through it and can finish with alley-oops. Those are easy buckets. It's just not worth it. Hey, so, Greg, 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 how many times do you get stopped by a well-meaning fan throughout the year and then ask the question, hey man, yeah. how come we don't how come we don't press more? 
Yeah, because presses don't work. Yeah, you know when they yeah. work. You know I when guess, they work. I guess it's, a, it's at least a, a dozen times each season you get you get stopped. I mean, well meaning. Look, I understand, and you know sometimes we feel like we have the athletes to do it. Occasionally, we'll have the rim protector at the back of the press that might be able to clean up some mistakes if the defense gets biased. Uh, but but uh, that uh, the press works in in bitty ball AAU basketball at, at high level college basketball. Uh, you don't see the the, the really good dominant uh, perennial powers uh, dabbling that, in it too much. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth. You know when it works fourth and fifth grade when you have <laughs> better athletes than the other kids and you yeah, score true. 120 points and all the parents are bitching at you for pressing. Yes, I get it. But I'm living I'll that right what, now. With my three yeah, sons for sure. You know. Uh, pressing doesn't work and zones don't work. And those are the two things like you just mentioned. We'll be out to dinner. Hey, God, we got a lot of athletes. Why don't we press? Why don't we play zone when teams are shooting good against us? And like, well, there's been one team in the history of college basketball that has won a national championship playing zone. And that's Syracuse. And they didn't win it because of their zone. They won it because we missed a lot of free throws. Like Kansas was the victim of their zone in the 03 national title game. And we didn't lose it because we didn't do good against their zone. We lost it because we missed a ton of free throws. That's it. That's how that game worked. Obviously, you were there. Unfortunately, you were injured. But uh, zones and presses don't work in big-time basketball. Nothing against Sanford running it. They won 29 games. They had a great season. But it just doesn't translate. Uh, on to the Gonzaga game. Um, I contend that it sounds crazy, but we almost lost that game in the first half. And I'll tell you why. We shoot the ball unbelievably well. We get some easy buckets. Our offense was clicking. But defensively, whenever we'd make a shot, we'd give up an equalizer on the other end because we just did not. We weren't dialed in defensively. And they got so many ball screen dump down easy layups or wide open threes. And we had a one point lead going into half and we played a really, really good half of basketball offensively. Then in the second half shots weren't falling for us and they made everything. I don't know who would have beat Gonzaga in that second half. It wasn't the refs. It wasn't anything other than Gonzaga made shots and we didn't perfect storm it blows up on you. And that's what happened. And whether you lose by one or 21, doesn't really matter. Your season's over. It's like your dog died or a family member. And me and you are in the locker room, just our head in our hands, just like sucks. And you, you and I have been around a long time and we've ended twice in the last, what, well, let's call it three times in the last 35 years with wins and went home happy, right? 88, 08, and 22. There's a lot of other times that we've gone home very upset, just like Saturday night. And what do you do? You think about it a little bit. Uh, you watch a little film, maybe, but it's over. And you got to retool. You got to decompress on Sunday and get right back in there on Monday. And that's exactly what our coaching staff is doing, getting in that office, getting on Zoom calls, finding out what you got left, what you got to get. And it's just a massive jigsaw puzzle and a game of dominoes all mixed in one. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and, and I agree what, what you said there uh, about not having a good feeling about things early uh, in that Gonzaga game, uh, though we were, uh, you know, toe to toe with them in the first half. You know, watching them play McNeese State, the game uh, before ours on, on Thursday, uh, I had the thought that. Uh, as much as Sanford uh, is skilled at speeding teams up and turning them over and playing their style of basketball, Gonzaga is just as skilled and elite as wearing you down. I mean, that's probably one of the bigger teams, if not the biggest team uh, that we faced uh, this year. And then you consider having to play them on a Thursday, Saturday split where the times are a little off. Um, you know, altitudes up there a little bit. So you're experiencing that. And then, of course, a, a, a diminished bench. Uh, man, it just really seems like they wore us down. I mean, you know, big on the front line, you know, big, big, big guards. 
Uh, and then, you know, a couple other guys at, you know, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, 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 long athletic coming off the bench. And, and so you got into the second half and I'm thinking, OK, we went toe to toe. But did we really get any easy baskets in that first half? I mean, it looked like we had to labor and work for every single basket. And then towards the end of that second half, Greg, as you mentioned, they got a couple of early slips. We, we missed assignments on a couple of late ball screen rotations. Obviously, you know, Hunter has had trouble, you know, guarding the ball screen there. So we got to have guys behind it, making sure they're in the right spot to be able to tag the roll man. We were late on several of those easy dunks. Uh, and those can be frustrating. Like not all baskets are equal. When your opponent can get easy baskets and you see that, it, it kind of does something to you. And then, of course, when we got to the second half and, and uh, of course, it was alarming for everyone. We got to the 1052 mark and and I, and I looked at the stat sheet and, hey, one of the highlights of the tournament, even though I know it was difficult for us because the first weekend, Danny Manning in the building got a chance to sit next to he and Julie for two games. All right. KU icon, one of my heroes, dear friend, friend of the program. Great. So we're just sitting there talking ball back and forth, passing the stat sheet back and forth. And Danny pointed at the stat sheet and it said four of twenty seven. We shot four of 27 uh, halfway through uh, the, the, the the second half. And, and what does that do? It's not just about going tit for tat and basket for basket. But when you can actually score baskets, it energizes your defense. And our inability to score fed into a non-energized defense. And you add the fatigue into that. You add the frustration into that. And we just did not have what it took to even keep it competitive uh, late into that second half. So, yeah, hats off to Gonzaga, hats off to Mark Few. Hey, that's the matchup everyone wanted to see, right? You want to see two of the best coaches in college basketball be able to go at it. You know, two teams that were seemingly down, had down years as compared to their standards, uh, but still give, um, you know, give a, a pretty big fight there. And I'm sure that won't be the last time we see Gonzaga. But, yeah, there are a lot of different factors that went into that. And you mentioned those two years in a row of two early exits. But, I mean, you got to consider, you know, missing coach self. Uh, last year on the sideline, that's got to be worth some points. And then, of course, you go into, um, you know, the the the, the tournament, um, a, a difficult travel schedule there without, you know, your your, your star player, your All American, you know, twenty points a game, Kevin McCullough. Man, it would be nice to go into those things whole. But I thought the boys gave a good effort despite all the factors around it. Well, you said something where we labored to score, and you're exactly right. I remember some plays in the first half that were demoralizing we'd shoot a shot and miss it i remember kj chased it down in the right corner made an unbelievably athletic hustling play and it kind of threw it backwards and we caught it and eventually made a three and it was a great play awesome go to the other end ball screen pocket pass wide open three like that and you're like we just had to have an unbelievable play made by kj adams and Nick and Dewan just to, to get, get a shot, off, just to get a <laughs> shot. And they go down there, boom, boom, shot done. And it's like, all right. And then we come down, make another nice play, a deflection and whatever would happen. You're like, all right, well, things are going our way, but man, in that second half, they just didn't. And as you watch more and more basketball around the country, and you obviously watch all of our games, we had to get guys set up to be successful. Bill had to do one of his best coaching jobs. And I know people will look back at this and say, he's 23 and 11. That was his best coaching job. He had to get schemes set up to get the ball to guys to score. Not, all right, we jacked around for 20 seconds. Now, Wayne, go get a bucket. Or Paul Pierce. We just didn't have that. We didn't have creativity. And when I watch Creighton, or Clemson, or whoever, they've got guys. And this is—I I, don't—I don't want the public to think I'm bemoaning and taking away from our guys. But when you watch other basketball, there's guys that can just ball screen, take a mid-range jumper, get to the rim, penetrate and pitch, score off the bounce. We just didn't really have that. Everything had to be set up, and winning 23 games doing that is impressive. Could we have won 27, 28? For sure. Could we be in the final four? For sure. But we talked about it early on this year. The margin for error is very, very thin.
Mm-hmm. And when Kevin got hurt, which we think was in that K-State game in Manhattan, the next six weeks were tough because Kevin was a huge part of our motion, of everything that we do on both ends of the floor. And when he wasn't 100%, that's where that margin of error being so thin really impacted us. Yeah, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and as you look back and, and kind of survey the roster, I think you're, you're spot on with um, – you know, have the guy that can just go get his basket. You know, late shot clock, there doesn't need to be a play call. You get the rebound and transition. Like, you don't need to slow it down and, and get a play call from the bench, but you can just go create your own. You know, we thought we had one of those type of guys, and it didn't quite work out um, with that. Uh, Kevin uh, is is probably more a guy that can score off of a long closeout or, or a, um, you know, a driving kick off Juan. He, you know, obviously – garners more attention than some of our guys that were out there, um, you know, during the tournament. But I, when you have to have give attention to a guy like Kevin, uh, more space is created and more opportunity is created uh, for other guys as well. And so I imagine that's something that we're certainly going to be looking to, to add to the roster. And, you know, I know there was a little bit of controversy over over coaches comments, um, you know, about about shutting Kevin down uh, a little bit earlier. And, and, and from my vantage point, you know, and maybe one thing that people don't understand is like, the guys, once they get to the tournament site, have to have, you know, mandatory press conferences. And there have been enough, um, you know, questions asked around Kevin's health and to have our guys have to, to to respond and answer to that. So I think in a lot of ways, you know, the comment when they first got there to say, hey, we're going to let you know this is what we're doing with Kevin was actually to try to protect our guys, you know, right. that we're still having to be behind the microphone regularly. Um, during the press conferences where it's like, hey, let's just let's just clear the air so our guys can focus. And then, you know, of course, it got uh, misconstrued and misunderstood mm-hmm. and maybe got spun into something uh, that it was never intended to be. And, and and even the comments after the game in terms of his mindset being towards next season, uh, you know, even though it was vocalized, that's standard operating procedure, not just for basketball coaches, right. but football coaches, baseball coach, any coach. Any business person that get towards the end of their fiscal year, that gets towards the end of their busy season, their mind starts to go strategically right. to, hey, what are some things that we're going to have to do next year? Especially, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, when now we've got the portal opens while the season is still being played, right? And so it's a the brand new dynamic, which you and I both have strong thoughts about. Look, I'm, I'm pro portal as it gets. But wow, while you're still playing and competing in the NCAA tournament, while, you know, so now you're having to think about, hey, who might go, who might stay back in your conference tournament, you know, as you're trying to, you know, assemble and get your roster ready uh, for, for, for the next season. And so, uh, you know, I thought those comments, there was a little bit more, you know, kind of controversy infused into them than what I really think uh, it was it was worth making. Yeah, and before we get to the transfer portal, I want to follow up with one thing. And Kansas fans have really short memories. I mean, we're all doom and gloom. We got beat. It's frustrating. And, oh, God, two losses in a row in the round of 32. True. Year before that, what do we do? Won a national title. Year before that, what would we have done? We would have had a chance to uh, uh, win, a na- oh, two years before that, win a national title. We were the overall number one seeder. We would have been. So, yes, the last couple of years have sucked. It's not fun. Arkansas and now Gonzaga, but, hey, this program's in a fantastic place. There's nobody in the country we trust more than Bill Self in getting this back to where we're winning a two-game tournament, going to the Sweet 16, and winning the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, going to the Final Four and having a chance at a national championship. We got – the staff and the administration and the support to do it. Obviously there's, it's going to be a big couple months back to your point about, Hey, it's the season's still going on. Gonzaga and Iowa state who are still playing got transfers to commit to them already. Two guys declared at the, I don't know, middle of March, whenever the portal opened and two teams that are still in the tournament got guys to commit to them. So that tells me that their staff and their extended staff is out looking as they have to be because it's such a dumb rule that the advantage goes to the teams that didn't make the tournament 
because they're out there just telling everybody, oh, you don't want to go to Iowa State or Kansas or whatever. You want to come to us, and nobody has the chance to defend themselves. Now, Gonzaga and Iowa State figured it out, got a couple. I don't remember the names of who they got, but I think Gonzaga got a guy from Pepperdine and not sure who Iowa State got. But my point being, the silver lining, I guess, would be Kansas, by losing early, can now go out and figure out what their needs are. Now, what their needs are and what's reality are two different things because we don't know who's going to be back. We, we just don't because the transfer portal not only applies to your current players, it applies to the freshmen, the national letter of intent, it applies to everybody. So the portal is only going to grow more and more as the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight in. When teams lose, kids are going to leave those programs to put their name out there. So Wayne and, and I are going to – A little teaser. Yeah, little teaser because Greg and I are going to devote a full episode to – uh, portal combat talking about the transfer portal and uh, and all the the intricacies and nuance uh, around that so so stay tuned stay tuned for that folks so yeah w- you know we just don't know yet but what you have to do when you don't know is make as much contact as you can with anything that you know about anyone that you know about and, and obviously if you have Twitter or Instagram or whatever they're they're out there and everybody looks great on a Twitter post or X or whatever they call it now. Everybody's great. They average 17 points a game, shooting 43% from a three-point line. I mean, you you look at it, and we're like, oh, well, this guy, this guy looks good. Well, okay. You know, you got to, you know, there's there's some Cam Spencers out there that transferred to Connecticut that I don't think people would have looked at him last year like, "Ah, yeah, I want that guy or Dalton Connect at Tennessee. I mean, he's going to be an all, he's an all American from Northern Colorado, who's a four man that put himself in the transfer portal. It's one of the great stories. Grant Nelson, a big kid at Alabama is from North Dakota state. As many great stories as there are, there's stories that you don't even hear about because there's, I don't know, 1800 kids in the portal. Do you know how many of those 1800 kids find a home? Not 1800. There's hundreds of kids that don't materialize anywhere. So all the good stories, the Grant Nelsons and the- Come on, man. You got to pump the brakes. Got to pump the brakes, man. You're leaking into our next app. Oh, my bad. My bad. All right. Good stuff, though. Good stuff. So, we got we, we to gotta reel folks back in for next week. I don't know what I'd do without you. The Jacker Podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Xfinity, and Black and Veach. Uh, to kind of put a cherry on top of the men's season, a lot of positives. 12 and 1 in the non con. Uh, obviously, uh, struggled during the conference and the Big 12 tournament was just one, you know, one, one, one thing to about. Me, one thing that kept me from spiraling down into a deep depression because of the second round exit is thinking about what our season could have looked like and shuddering because of it. What our season could have looked like if Kevin and Hunter had, or anyone had health issues earlier in the year, like earlier in conference play, earlier in non-conference play when we had, you know, hellacious non-conference schedule. I mean, we're talking like potentially not making the tournament. We're talking about the streak of consecutive tournament wins, which we are at the top of the food chain in that being if broken. The tournament, if the NCAA tournament selection committee went on – let's call it mid uh, early February to mid March. We don't make the tournament. I mean, we really struggled down the stretch 12 and one in the non-con pretty good start early on lost some games that we shouldn't have lost, which well, makes the record out of look- six, lose five out of six in that. Like what was, was that yeah, I mean, finished? 29 point loss to Texas tech 30 point loss to Houston 20 some odd point loss to Cincinnati. Like, it did not look good, and so that's why the Sanford win was so important because if we lose that game and everyone just looks at the last six weeks, and that sounds crazy that we're, like, pounding our chest over beating Sanford, but it was a good game. That was a really good yeah. basketball hey, team. For, for that first-round win was an absolute must. Um, you know, we knew you show up and you compete your tails off no matter who's waiting for you in the second round. And guess what? Every game is hard. Every team is good. That's what it means to be in the tournament. 
Um, yeah, but we would hey, have to play a, a perfect game. You, you know what's know, going on right play. now at, at the uh, Auburn Tiger podcast or the Kentucky Wildcat podcast? <laughs> they probably they probably have a couple of handsome, <laughs> athletic, humorous guys like us, former great players that are doing this exact same thing, and they're pissed. And the people in the in, in Lexington now Auburn a little different. They probably shouldn't have lost, but I don't know if their fan base is upset as Kentucky right now. But hey, this is going on all over the country. Doesn't make ours any more digestible. But we say it all the time. We're a four seed this year, and we're pissed. We're mad as Kansas fans. We're spoiled. We're greedy. How could we be a four seed? Like. There's some people to the west of us that would love to have been a eight seed or a nine seed or the play-in game. Or, or, a, they, or a non W a non NIT first round loss type team. That one. Right. Oh that my one. bad. I said that. I, I didn't, oh, I didn't, okay. Yeah, you said it. But, not, <laughs> but hey, they didn't get invited to the party. We did. Uh our reputation precedes us. And yes, we should have done better. No question about it. But there, it, it, it's hard to win in the NCAA tournament. And the way we finished, it made it even more difficult. Uh, we have an unbelievable amount of trust and faith in our head basketball coach who does it right and has won two national titles. And before he hangs it up, he's going to win another one. And we're going to be sitting here, and there's going to be a brown drink in our hands, and you and I are going to have a, a fantastic time talking about another national title, but that's a, Indeed. it's a ways away. It's a ways away. And that transfer portal, what'd you call it? Portal combat, portal combat, a, a play on words to the, 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 the video, video. game classic yeah. that I grew up on mortal combat on Sega Genesis. Uh, if you know, you know, um, portal combat, actually, I think Joe Dooley actually might've coined that. And I've just kind of rode that rode that wave, uh, since then, but, and having uh, the Joe not, Dooley's and Doc Sadler's and Curtis Towns and oh Norm yeah, Robert turnover Kevin, rocks and getting after it. They they, they, they got to be bulldogs. They got to be out there and, and 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 find the 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 guys the the Grant Nelsons and the Cam Spencers that are still playing right now that have Dalton connects and and they that's who we got to find to to intertwine with our core that's we think is coming back so. Put a bow on that, 23 and 11, 34, 35 in a row, whatever you want to call it for NCAA tournament consecutive appearances. Hey, you know, I look at, we're all upset. Solid year. Yep, solid year. Can you imagine being a North Carolina fan? Two years ago, you got a 15-point lead and you lose to Kansas for the national title. The year after that, you don't make the tournament. Don't Don't make make tournament can you imagine the carnage and the whatever would happen in Lawrence if we don't make the tournament it would be like I don't even know how to describe it because I've never had to live through it except 1988 89 when that was a a mandated by the NCAA deal you know and so we don't even know what it's like but again think about that now they're a one seed uh right now and they got a chance to to go on but but some of these one seeds aren't going to make it. The, 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 there's too much parity in this tournament. There's going to be some ones and twos that get beat this weekend, and and it's it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the to the games, and uh, uh, I don't wish that on anyone. But hey, I like watching good basketball, and shot makers are going to have to make shots, and we'll see what happens. I don't think there's one team that just stands out at me with the exception of UConn. They've now won eight games in a row, six last year, and two already this year going in the Sweet 16 by double digits. Think about that. Like, we've had to grind. We had to grind. They're still defending champs. They're still defending champs for sure. They're defending champs until they aren't. But, hey, you mentioned liking to watch good basketball, especially in March. One of my – Favorite experiences, maybe all time, not the all time, one of my all time favorite experiences actually happened during the Sanford game when a significant portion of our fan 
of our of our fan section uh, there at the Delta Center Arena while our team was on the court were all staring down, looking at their phones on the edge of their seat because our women's basketball team in Southern Carolina was going toe to toe with a Big Ten power Michigan and Southern fighting California. their way back, fighting their way back from a 10 point deficit uh, that would then propel them to play USC, the number one seed in that region on their home court uh, and play one of the best players in the country. And man, what an inspired effort uh, Brandon Snyder and those ladies showed in fighting their way back. Zakai Franklin had one of her all time best games, a super senior who's been great all year long, uh, refusing to go quietly into the night, man, getting that left hand going as she's so done for, for, for so many years and, and, uh, and finding a way to, to, to fight and win uh, over, over Michigan in that nice comeback. Yeah, we were sitting there doing the pregame and just constantly watching it. And we're like, oh, man, we're down 10. Doesn't seem like anything's going on. We couldn't get the internet to work to actually watch the game. So we were just watching the ESPN GameCast deal. And then we're like, all right, all right, we're climbing back. We're climbing back. And then uh, hits that big three to tie it up and then blow them out in the overtime. In overtime, and then, yeah. And then the uh, uh, your, your prize or your reward <laughs> is to play – <laughs> one seed in their own building, which you were able to get to, uh, flew there on Sunday and watched it on Monday, and things weren't looking good early. Uh, there, oh, we were down 12, maybe 13 at one point. Yeah. At halftime, maybe down 10. And then in that third quarter, you know, we talk about Juju a lot, but Samaya Nichols, who you and I – Come on now. About, yeah, we got one too. We got one too. And now, obviously, Caitlin Clark and Juju and all – and and I tell you that 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 other uh, other player for USC that made all the threes, man, she was she was really good. She just kind of pulled up in transition and just kept hitting daggers against us every time we kind of labored to score. They'd come down and make it look easy, and they 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 just put on a shooting clinic. And but our but I tell you what, I, I love our team fighting back. They got it within one at. Mid, midway through the third quarter, I remember I texted you a picture of my TV screen. I'm like, ah, oh, this is great. Yeah, and I appreciate and I, you staying up late, man. I was like a 920 tips, you know, tip time oh, start. I'm a, you know, I'm a I'm a night owl. I watch it all, but but the uh, I was like, did I jinx it? Because once I sent that to you, the one point deficit went to 13 real fast. And uh, but ton of credit to Brandon Snyder and his team did an unbelievable job. Taking last year's frustration of not getting in the tournament, going on and having a magical ride to the WNIT championship, and then changing the way they do things and and, and scheduling some big time competition and started out, there was a struggle because they were playing teams that were better than them, playing well, but losing. So the record, you're kind of like, oh, this doesn't look good, but they finished strong in the Big 12 earn a spot in the NCAA tournament, get that win against Michigan in overtime, and really put up a, a great fight against one of the best teams in the country on their home court. Yeah, no, it's true. And, 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 and you know, Coach Snyder and those ladies in that locker room, they're just like the men, not really into moral victories, uh, but you're right. They did fight their tail off. And, and it is interesting to, to feel that different dynamic from the women's side of the game where, the top seeds get a chance to host in their home building. And it was pretty electric there uh, in, in Galen Arena and, you know, had some celebrities there and, you know, Cheryl Miller and John Wall and Quavo and, uh, you know, a couple other, um, you know, notable USC student athletes. And, and so it was really, really fired up there. But, man, there is a significant difference from, you know, the top four or five women's basketball uh, teams in the country and then everybody else. I mean, when you look at their starting lineup and you see they don't have one player under six feet, one inches, like it is ridiculous. And they've, you know, of course, we, we, we've been so thankful and proud of, of a player like Tiana Jackson and her gifting being, you know, six, six and athletic. Well, guess what? USC had three of them and they were just reeling them. And off they the could shoot there. And they can shoot three. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, obviously, you know, Caitlin Clark is getting, you know, a lot of the, the national attention on the women's basketball scene, and rightfully so. 
but Juju Watkins is actually on pace as a freshman uh, to surpass uh, Caitlin Clark's uh, scoring record if she decides to stay and things keep going well for her. But, hey, how about Samaya Nichols stepping up to that uh, challenge? And, and you know, I, I, I was pretty confident that that was going to be the case because Samai had grown up playing against Juju on, on the right. EYBL circuit and, you know, USA basketball and things like that. And so as much as everyone was kind of starstruck about her ability and her reputation, uh, Samaya approached that game with a lot of confidence saying, look, I've seen her before. I've competed against her before and put up a heck of a performance. And it's helpful for Kansas in the future, not only for Samaya's confidence herself, but guess what? A lot of eyes were watching that and they're like, hey, whoa, Kansas has a top freshman too. Hey, that's someone that 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 they can build around. Hey, that's someone that I like to go into and, and, and to play with because guess what? The transfer portal is at play just as much on the women's side mm -hmm. as it is on the men's side, and we can certainly get into that. But hey, a, a great season uh, by Coach Snyder and uh, and the Jayhawks there, and and um, yeah, they should feel good about it as well. You know, I, I've watched more women's basketball this year than ever before. And it's it's great the way it's promoted when it's on. Uh, and you watch the Caitlin Clarks and you watch the Samaya Nichols and Juju. I mean, it and, it and it wasn't like I wasn't a fan before. I just, you know, got you got a lot of stuff going on and you can only put your attention to so much, but it kind of grabbed you. And uh, Amy would walk downstairs and see me watching a game that I don't care about necessarily, but it's, it's fun to watch. The crowds are great and uh, really been an enjoyable season. And hopefully uh, the momentum in the entire women's game can continue to build off of a, a real magical season and, and still two more weekends to go. I do want to get your opinion on something uh, with Caitlin Clark. They, they, they had a real uh, difficult game against uh, who did they beat at home? It was West Virginia. Big 12 team and and they they really bodied her and 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 frustrated her and the fouls were what they were and even a more difficult uh, type of game to call when you have a, a star like that but she made a shot just like you did or I did and she and she got fouled and she's run down the court and she lip said something that wasn't you know something you want your kids saying but it's the heat of the moment right she she used a word that you're not supposed to use, but every athlete says it when they're kind of talking trash or trying to spur their team on. And the vitriol and the frustrations of the Twitter world or whatever social media, like, can you believe that this role model would do that? And I'm like, I, I just kind of look at it like if a man did it, let's just use Michael Jordan, which he did it all the time. He's a competitor. He's great. That's how he wants to win. So does Caitlin Clark. So does Juju or so does Samaya. And I, I just found that. And I don't know if you saw what I'm talking about, but I'm like, that was great. That's the way it should be. She's a competitor. She wants to win. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to uh, necessarily de de defend it, but, you know, you're right. There is a, the heat of the moment. There is, um, you know, you know, com competitive environments where, you know, stakes are, are, are really, really high and uh, emotions run high along with him. And now we've got more cameras uh, right. than ever in sports. And guess what? We've got more talking heads and we've got more opinions that are readily thrown out there about any and everything, um, which doesn't necessarily validate those opinions or thoughts. Everyone's entitled to it, uh, but it doesn't mean that you've got to give a ton of uh, of credit to it, but you're probably not wrong in the sense that, hey, guess what? Draymond Green has made a living and probably stayed in the league longer than his, you know, particular skill set, um, you know, would probably keep him because he's had that type of kind of bad boy, roughneck, loud mouth, trash talking attitude. And, you know, that's probably not the same type of can get consideration is given towards towards the women's side. But it didn't catch my attention uh, very much. But but I get what you're saying. But I'll tell you what. What has caught my attention is as you and I return back to Lawrence, we're here in the building, we're thinking about next year. How about all the construction that has started in Allen Fieldhouse? As we it's hard to get anything. On a, 
It's we like a, a $50 million renovation of one of the most historic venues of all of college basketball. It's going to be nice and shiny and new features and all. But guess what? It's loud. It's inconvenient. It's dusty for us to have to, to work here on a daily basis. The locker room is about to be shut down for the guys here uh, before too long. But, but progress is being made. And so not only can we get excited about – the potential in the future that both of our basketball programs have for 24-25. But guess what? We're going to have the top venue in college basketball be even better. And that's pretty exciting as well. You're exactly right. I was walking around yesterday and I was just walking kind of by the locker room up to my office and there was a wall just out of nowhere. <laughs> there was just a wall with like some metal framing. I'm like, what do, what do we or how do I get to like, a lot of there? hard hats, a lot of hard hats and eye protection around here? That's for sure. Yeah, there's cherry pickers, there's guys on it doing stuff, there's temporary lights, and it's awesome. I can't wait for it to all be done. And it is annoying, but hey, that's progress. You and I, how many times have we said that? We drive by the football stadium. I counted 12 bulldozers or whatever, like earth movers working at the same time the other day at the football stadium. I was over there for practice watching uh, a little bit of spring practice. It's amazing how much manpower is going on over there. How many holes and concrete trucks coming in and walls and, and it's an aggressive timeline for the football stadium and for Allen field house. You know, we know that we're going to have football game or excuse me, basketball games in Allen field house in early November or late October. So it has to be done. The scoreboard, the speakers, the best building in America, which is Allen Fieldhouse, is going to get better. And it's going to get better just aesthetically with paint and lights and speakers and uh, hospitality rooms, bathrooms, new seating that will have chair back options for more people because sitting in bleachers isn't fun. I'm uncomfortable right now. And I'm sitting on a bar stool <laughs> in, my, in my kitchen and sitting in a bleacher at Allen Fieldhouse not enjoyable for old fat guys backs. So more chair backs for guys like me, uh, the offices, the Williams fund offices, everything is getting a, 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 a upgrade and credit to Travis Goff, chancellor Gerard and all that they've uh, been able to engineer for us, for our student athletes, for our staff. It's a, uh, it's a great time to work for Kansas Athletics and the University of Kansas. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, 23 and 11 for the men. Uh, Kansas women go out with the loss to USC. You mentioned it. The Portal Combat episode, Portal Combat episode will be out here in the next few weeks. And we haven't quite decided when we're going to do it because a lot of a lot of things have to happen for us to have a complete show because we could do a rumor mill one and we could sit there and scroll through our phones, tell you who's available, what percentage they're shooting, how many rebounds they got at whatever directional school they played at. But I tell you what, there's a Dalton Connect in there. There's a Cam Spencer in there. There's a Grant Nelson in there. One of those guys is in there. We've just got to find them. And the same thing goes for Brandon Snyder and his staff. They're out there, and it's not easy. And once you get someone, you could lose someone that you thought you were going to keep. So it's a never-ending circle of life. And uh, But I got complete faith in Bill Self and Brandon Snyder. And uh, come October, it's going to be a blast. And before that, Longwood, late August, Sporting Park, going to be a great atmosphere for football i went out and watched a little practice the other day and it was just the just being out there i don't know much about football but i love seeing them hit seeing them moving just whistle blows and they're all in sync and it's just fun to watch a lance leipold practice with all of his guys so uh the spring showcase is coming up april 12th out at rock chalk park so put that on your calendar and make sure that you come out and support our Guarantee rate bowl champ, Kansas Jayhawks. A lot of guys returning, a lot of newbies. Uh, once spring practice is over, that could be another portal show because Lance and his staff isn't done. There's going to be some movement here and there. So definitely something to keep your eye on. Uh, 
more basketball talk, more golf talk, every spring sports going at it. Uh, JR Acker podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System, Black and Veach, and Xfinity. Greg Gurley, Wayne Simeon, there he is. Uh, out, rock chalk. <laughs> <laughs>